Hey, thanks for joining us here in the shop today. You know, we get a lot of feedback from you Mopar enthusiasts who like our engine projects and our buildups here, but what you really want to see is an affordable, streetable Mopar engine that uses off-the-shelf parts. Plus, one that's simple to assemble, even for a Chevy guy like me. But before we get going, here's a look at why it's easy for any gearhead to appreciate that legendary Pentastar performance. Beep, beep. We put a Dodge in our garage, honey. No matter what your muscle car calling may be, you gotta love those monumental Mopars from the 60s and early 70s. Why, they were born to run. The run they did when driven by people like racing legend Ronnie Sox in his 68 Cuda. And if you need proof that Mopar mania is still alive, we just go to one of the many events for enthusiasts like this one all around the country. We've always been a little tick left of center, and uh, we're very loyal. Whether they show their loyalty in the seat of a Superbird that dominated circle tracks in the 70s, or behind the wheel of this supercharged 1969 Roadrunner. Anybody can restore one. It takes a real man to cut one up. It is getting harder to find an ideal Mopar street strip project car, but A-bodies like the Dodge Dart and Plymouth Duster make good candidates. A few seasons ago, we built up a 500 cubic inch race motor that started with a Mopar performance block that made 672 horsepower on the engine dyno. And then we dropped it into Brian Savati's 71 Duster, and Brian soon had himself a tire twist and consistent bracket racer, knocking down quarter mile runs in the tens, while knocking down the Blue Oval and Bow Tie competition. Well, the old Duster is still tearing up the tracks, running deep into the tens, and believe it or not, Brian's still tuning on it, too. Now, he tells us there's still a lot more left in it. Yeah, well, here's another A-body that's dust in the competition on the show circuit. Now, it belongs to Romeo Furio, who calls this custom color match Manic Mango. Now, the mostly stock body rolls on a set of Budnick 17 and 18 inch gasser rims, and the suspension's been upgraded with tubular control arms and those bare racing brakes. The engine is a 372 stroker small block. In fact, it uses a 340 block married up to a 360 crank. Fuel delivery is handled by a fast electronic fuel injection setup that helps it get 22 miles a gallon on the highway. Spitfire headers feed into a pair of Flowbasters. And all that power feeds into a Tremec TKO 5-speed and 8 and 3 quarter rear end. Man, you got to love all those A-bodies, even if they're not Chevelles. After all, they're lightweight, good looking, and since Chrysler built so many of them, well, you can still pick one up pretty cheap. Yeah, that's what we plan to do after we get started with the heart of our A-body project, the engine. Now, unless you live close to a high-quality machine shop, the question is, who's going to do the prep work on your block? Well, if you start with a crate motor, you found the answer. After all, why not keep it simple, affordable, and easy? Yeah, if you live in Possum Squat, Kentucky, <laughs> chances are you're going to have to go the mail order route for most of your parts. Now, horsepower isn't exactly reality TV, but we learned a long time ago that if you want to be a survivor, well, you've got to play the game by your rules. So we made our first move by sticking our nose in the JEGS catalog where we came up with this Magnum 360 short block. They start with a seasoned block, then do all the machining operations like grinding the crank, boring the cylinders, and resizing the rods. Then they drop in a new set of aluminum pistons, a hydraulic roller camshaft, and a new timing set. Now, that roller cam that they install in the short block's kind of mild, and we want a more aggressive piece to go with the Edelbrock heads that we'll bolt on later. So we got on the phone, called the Comp Camp's tech line, gave them such vital information as, well, compression ratio, the kind of carb we'll use, displacement, and here's the grind they came up with. It specs out at 230, 236 degrees duration at 50 thousandths with a gross lift of 553, 565. Now the intake center line's at 110 degrees, and tell you what, this cam ought to make great power up to about 6,000 RPM. <laughs> it really ought to make my Magnum PI. Now, before we can install the new cam, we first need to get rid of the old one by removing the timing cover. Then we'll swap over the timing gear and stab the new one in place. Well, I'll tell you what, while Chuck finishes breaking her down, we're going to take a short break for these messages. We'll be back with more of our Magnum 360 buildup right after this. 
Aren't you done yet? Coming up, the Mopar Magnum gets a set of high-performance heads, along with an equally stout air gap intake and a 750 CFM carb to feed it. Later in the show, take a few simple tools and you can make a cool headliner that's a cut above your neighbors. Welcome back to the shop where today we're making some Mopar power with our Magnum 360 buildup. Now I just finished installing our camshaft straight up, then I reinstalled the timing set and the timing cover. Well now I guess Joe is going to cover our butts by checking out that bottom end before we button it up. Now, I don't know that's a lot to cover, but since crate motors are mass produced, it's always a good idea to check your rod and main clearances and well if you got a set of mics in your shop, go ahead and use them. However, a piece of inexpensive plastic gauge from the parts shop will do just fine. Thanks. After removing the cap, clean the journal and bearing surface. Lay a piece of plastic gauge on the journal. Reinstall the cap and torque it to the recommended specs. Then remove the cap and using the included gauge, measure the width of the plastic gauge. What'd you get there? Uh, right about two thousandths. Yeah, that's right on the money. Well, just follow the same procedure for the rest of the rods and mains, and that's it. If they are out of spec, well, that means a trip to the machine shop. Well, since we get to stay in our shop, we can go ahead and install our Moroso 8-quart oil pan. Now, what I like about this is all this internal baffling here really helps keep the oil down in the sump where it belongs plus the extra depth keeps it away from the crank. Now this pan will also fit just about any Mopar chassis combination and it'll also work with just about any flywheel starter setup. Of course you're going to have to use one of their extended pickups in your pump as well but before you screw it in place go ahead and give it a dab of thread sealant right here. That looks pretty good. Clearance on these small block Mopars is pretty tight between the oil pump and the oil pan, especially if you're using a high volume pump. So make sure you test fit everything before you cinch it down. Now, the real problem is these two bolts right here on the pump, if they have interference, you can just go ahead and dimple the oil pan right here with a ball peen hammer. While Chuck finishes up the bottom end, let's jump ahead, literally. As we mentioned earlier, our goal is a stout but streetable engine, so our combination includes a set of these Edelbrock Performer heads. The intake ports are 171 cc's for good off idle response and torque, and notice how they've been port matched and smooth to improve the flow. Now the 63 cc combustion chambers are filled with 202 160 valves for about a 10 and a quarter compression ratio with those flat top pistons. We'll be able to run our Magnum on premium pump gas since the cylinder heads are aluminum and we're using a cam that'll bleed off some of that low end cylinder pressure. Well, I don't suppose you're ready for these things, are you? Hey, I'm way ahead of you there, pal. I've already dropped in our comp roller lifters and a couple of these Mr. Gasket pieces here on the block, so now all we gotta do is hit the dowel pins. Think we can do that? Yeah. Good deal. We're using ARP bolts to hold everything together here, and well, you want to make sure that you follow Edelbrock's three-step torque sequence and end up at 95 foot-pounds. The Edelbrock RPM air gap intake is a perfect match for our head and cam combination. Just check it out. It's a dual plane design that makes great power from 1500 to 6500 RPM. And this air gap down here is going to help keep that incoming air and fuel charge cool to help us make more power. Right you are. Well, we're going to complete our intake combination with a 750 CFM Mighty Demon Carp. Now, it's a double pump design 
with no choke horn and features radius venturis to improve airflow and adjustable air bleeds to help you dial it. Now, that's especially important if you're running a lot of cam with a low vacuum signal. Well, we just got a signal that it's time for us to take a little bit of a break. So why don't you stay where you're at and help keep our sponsors happy? Want some help with these studs? Yeah. Next, we'll show you the rest of our valve train for the Magnum 360, including roller rockers. Then we'll boat on something to give our Magnum a hot spark. And even a billet water pump to keep our engine cool. All coming up on Horsepower TV. Hey, welcome back to the shop as we finish off our Magnum 360, which is starting to look like a real engine now. Let me get these push rods dropped in and I'll show you the rest of our valve train. Mopar small blocks use shaft mounted rockers and Comp Cams has this setup featuring roller tip rockers to reduce friction. Now these are investment cast chrome molly pieces for accurate rocker ratios and they've been heat treated for stiffness and strength. Each shaft comes with spacers to keep the rockers properly positioned and they install using stock hardware. Well, I've just about finished running the valves on this side. Now, this is a solid roller lifter motor, so we're going to set the valve clearances at 16 thousandths on both the intake and exhaust. Like the rest of our engine combination, we want the ignition to be reliable and affordable too. So, we're going with a Mallory setup that includes their Unilite distributor, their Hi Fire 6 multi strike box with a built in rev limiter, and one of their ProMaster coils. We'll finish the job up with a set of their Pro Sidewinder wires. Now, we like this box because it's upgradable just in case we want to add some spray or even a blower later on. Before we can install that ignition, we need to bolt up our balancer first, and that's going to help us get our timing right. Now, we're using TCI's Rattler to help eliminate any torsional vibrations and crankshaft flex. It'll work with any standard pulley setup or crank trigger, and, well, it's also degreed, as you can see, to help you make any of those timing or valve lash adjustments. With number one cylinder at top dead center, Mark the cap and distributor body for the number one plug location. Drop the distributor in so the rotor points to the mark on the body. Then install the plug wires to the cap in the proper firing order. Keeping a hot engine like this one cool is critical to its performance, so we're going to use CSI's New Wave Billet Electric Water Pump. Now, this thing uses a computer-designed impeller that'll pump 37 gallons per hour. Plus, the pump motor has been tested for up to 5,500 hours of continuous running. Of course, it's anodized inside and out, and besides looking cool, that anodizing helps prevent corrosion. It comes with a matching block-off plate and the hardware you need to mount the pump and make the electrical connections. We want our Magnum to look as good as it runs, so for a little dressing, we're adding a set of these Edelbrock Elite valve covers, along with one of their matching air cleaner covers. Hey, that's nice. All we need now is a home for this thing. You bet. Now, I've got my eye on a couple of possible players, something that'll help us hook up the 450 horses we think this thing's going to crank out. Oh, I smell another bet coming on. No way. You haven't paid on that last one yet. And that's why you had not got a haircut yet, Samson. <laughs> well, while me and Delilah take a little bit of a break here, why don't you stay where you are? There's a whole lot more yet to come. Hey, look out now. Ready for a hot headliner? We ain't talking about the Rolling Stones. It's a cool tip to help your ride right after the break. Horsepower TV's Quick Tech is brought to you by WyoTech. No doubt about it, gravity plays havoc on a headliner. And while yours may not be as bad as this, I want you to meet an expert who can take some of the mystery out of headliner rehab. 
first you got to get the headliner out, which Dan's already done to save time. How'd you get the thing out, Dan? Well, first we remove all the trim around the windshield above the doors and the back glass. Oh yeah, this. And then we remove uh, the little hooks that we'll hold our clothes in there with, as well as the dome light. The dome light comes out last, because that holds the headliner in place while you're removing everything else. All right, let's talk tools. Okay, here we're gonna be using a glue pot gun for laying down our glue under a material. You don't necessarily have to have that, and you can use a siphon feed gun that you can get at a local parts store. We're also going to be using a soft brush and a wire brush to remove the material from the headliner before we cover it. And if we can't get it off of that, we'll use sandpaper as well. First thing we'll do is remove the material slowly and carefully so we don't damage the panel board because we're going to be reusing that and recovering it. You may have some residue left over on the panel board. We'll remove that with a brush or sandpaper. Now would be the time to take care of any cracks in the panel board like this. And to do that, we need to repair it from the backside, so we'll flip her over. Now to make sure everything's nice and flat, Dan's going to go over those rough edges with some more of that 40 grit. You spray contact cement over both a patch panel and the patch area and let it tack for five minutes. Then press the panel in place and it's fixed. Nice work, you'll never know a crack was there. Okay, at this point we could go ahead and cover the headliner and be done with it, but uh, being hot rodders, Dan and I want to make a little statement. So we drew some flames out on some quarter inch Landau foam. This is really gonna set the interior off and make it look really nice. Let's cut out the flames using a straight edge razor blade, cutting at a 45 degree angle away from our pattern. Spray glue on the back of the flames and on the panel board and let them tack. Lay your flames on the panel board and smooth them from the base to the tips. Be sure not to let your flame touch the board until you have it where you want it. Last, trim off the excess foam at the front of the headliner. Okay, now we're going to spray the contact cement again and make sure we get around the flames real well and spray the whole thing down. Now the moment of truth. Dan's ready to smooth down the finished headliner material. Fold the material over, smooth it down around the flames starting from the lowest spot to the highest spot. Well, there you have it, Joe. We're ready to put it back into the car. I tell you what, Dan, you not only helped this headliner, you made it pretty hot. Speaking of that. Horsepower TV's Hot Parts is brought to you by Jags. One call gets it all, one click gets it quick. I may not be able to carry a tune in a bucket, but I can sure tune a race header with Dynatec's Quick Tune Collector Muffler. Now, they claim no horsepower losses thanks to the straight-through core design, and these silencer cones allow you to adjust the sound level to meet your own local track's requirements. Each muffler comes with an angled and a straight outlet, plus a welded-in bung that allows you to run a pannyback system or even an O2 sensor for fuel injected applications. Now they make them for primary tubes from one and seven eighths to two and a half inches and the price, well, it won't send you down the tubes either at about 300 bucks a piece. Well, here's a look at a different set of tubes. These are designed to stiffen up your late model Mustang for improved performance on the track or on the street. It's an underbody X-Brace from Evolution Motorsport that provides both longitudinal and lateral support and it features a safety loop for your drive shaft. Now it's designed to improve overall vehicle structure, tying the front and back half together and eliminates body flex. Well, it's got a price that's not too stiff though, about $315. Well, Hotchkiss has some handling hardware that'll improve the cornering capabilities and straight line stability of any 59 to 70 full size Chevy. Now this setup includes new upper and lower control arms, an adjustable pannard rod, and front and rear sway bars. It also includes urethane bushings all around to minimize suspension deflection without hurting the ride quality. The upper control arms are fully adjustable to get optimum pinion angle, and the sway bars are hollow to reduce weight. Now to get one of these kits, you're going to have to get a handle on your wallet, with prices starting at about $1,400 per kit. Well, here's something you'll take a shine to, and so will your car's tires. 
Endurolast is a coating that will keep your car's tires showroom shiny, just like this hat, for up to six months. Now, it's made from an aerospace-inspired chemical that also protects them from UV rays and prevents dry rotting. The kit comes with cleaner, a brush-on applicator, and your choice of two coatings, black, of course, or for more radical statement on your rubber, how about Prismatic? Now, the kits start at about 20 bucks. Well, I ain't kitting around here. We're out of time for today, but you want to be sure and join us back here again next week. And we'll see you then. <laughs> hey, I like that Prismatic yeah. stuff. That looked good on your Mustang. I don't think so. Yeah.